everyone, and welcome to another episode of Max Planck's Florida's Neurotransmissions Podcast. I'm Leslie, and I'm here today with Joe. Our guest today is Dr. Daniela Samler, visiting us from Frankfurt, Germany, from the Max Planck Institute of Empirical Aesthetics. Yeah, and like its name implies, this is a uh, Max Planck Institute that's devoted to questions about aesthetic preference. So basically, what are things people like? What determines the things that people like? Why is art appealing? Things like that. And uh, today's guest on the podcast, it'll be very clear why her research at this, at this very interdisciplinary and um, influential institute is asking lots of really interesting questions about what's important kind of in our daily life, basically. Cool. And I think she's also a guest for our Science Meets Music series, and she's really a perfect fit for that because, you know, her expertise is in the neurocognition of music and languages. So I'm really excited to talk to her. Yeah, um, this is a fascinating conversation that we're about to have um, questions about what is music for? Like, why do humans appreciate music? Why is it so what how is our brain wired to perceive music and produce music? How does that relate to other structures in the brain that are related to like language and language development? That stuff is really fascinating to me. So um, we also venture into some new territory techniques wise. We talk about um, methods for recording brain-wide activity in humans during complex behaviors like playing the piano and things like that. So anyone who's interested in functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, or EEG recordings, this will be really interesting application of those techniques. Yeah, let's dive right in. Great. Your research group focuses on both music and language. So I wanted to actually start by asking how we should really think about music in relation to other forms of communication, such as speech or written forms? Well, actually, we are born musical. So when we are born, we are exposed a lot to music. So it's the first way of communicating. It's the first way people communicate with us in the voice. So mothers and fathers sing to their babies before talking. And uh, conversations between mothers and, and fathers and infants is pretty musical. So they are uh, singing. So they, they, they have musical dialogues. So in a way, the way we start communicating with the world is musical and the language comes later. So, so that's, that's the relationship I see between music and language. It's a, it's a common origin in development. And then we get this more sophisticated split into something that we call music today and and language, so, but in the beginning, it's it's one thing. So I, I guess my question is sort of like why, like as a species, and you, you've sort mm. of sort of gotten into this, like music is so powerful for communication. I guess there's a developmental component to it. It's like a way that we build rules off of, or, or what exactly it is about music that helps us to sort of structure our input in the world like when we're developing when we're when we're babies um and also thinking sort of evolutionarily like why our language sort of bootstraps off of this this process well when we uh start communicating it's a lot about rhythm and there's a lot about melody i mean that's something that's the basics of, of music the basic ingredients of music and that gives the music uh, structure so we have a regular beat we have, um, actually we have a hierarchical organization, so you can emphasize every, every beat, you can emphasize every second beat, you can emphasize every fourth beat. So that's, that's the structure that we have in music and that's what, what babies pick up on. As adults, you know, who mm. have sort of, uh, you know, grown up in a world where music is sort of central to our lives, like it's on the radio, our parents used it when they talked to us as children, in our brains, how much is the processing of music sort of uh, parallel with our processing of speech? What are some of the similarities and differences between how our brains like handle those types of inputs? Uh, there are many, many um, aspects that you can compare in, in music and language. It all started in the 1970s with Leonard Bernstein giving his uh, famous lectures at Harvard, where he compared actually music and language in several respects. So he, he compared them in terms of uh, structure, in, in terms of... Of, of syntax, the grammar of music. So you have certain rules that govern how tones and chords are arranged to make sense to us. And that 
that's what he compared to to the grammar and language. You have certain words that need to be arranged in a certain order to make sense to us. He also ventured into the questions whether there are similarities in meanings. I mean, that's a big, big topic. So can music express meaning in a similar way as language? Probably not. I mean, in language, you can say one word and it means a thing. Mm. In music, you, you have one tone and it doesn't mean a thing. So we don't have referential meaning. That's what we call it. It's not referential meaning in music, but still music can express a lot of meaning. I mean, just take the national anthem or take a, a Superman soundtrack. It means a thing, at least to people who know about these associations that you have with the music. Um, but it can also, music can express also a lot of social meaning, a lot of emotional meaning, right? And that's what we, when we get back to babies, that's what they pick up on, mm. you know? So music can uh, express sadness, can express happiness, can actually make us sad and can make us happy. And that's what we play with. Yeah. I mean, I, you, you you have the example of the Superman theme mm -hmm. song. So like if I'm like you know, listening to music while I'm in the shower in the Superman theme song, which I have, you know, in my playlist somewhere, I'm sure, mm -hmm. for running. I sort of, like, <laughs> puff out your chest a little bit more. You're, like, thinking, like, maybe, like, mm -hmm. there's definitely a psychological state that comes along with certain types of music. I assume some of that is learned and some of that is sort of built on, like, mm -hmm. maybe some of the things we've been exposed to early on. Is that right? I think there are two things, how music expresses um, th this type of meaning. Um, we believe that a lot comes uh, from body posture. So, for example, imagine somebody who feels sad. He or she will walk more slowly. Shoulders are hanging. She will speak more softly. Mm -hmm. And this is what music, sad music, mimics, mm -hmm. right? And um, on top of that, you have other cues. You have minor mode that is perceived as sad by Western listeners. That's probably something that is learned. Mm -hmm. um, that is associated with, with sadness. So there, there are two, um, two levels of how music can communicate. And this is also interesting when you go cross-cultural. So probably everybody in the world will walk more slowly with hanging shoulders and talk more softly when they are sad. So that's probably the cues other cultures can also pick up on in our Western music mm -hmm. and recognize it as something sad. Whereas there are other cues that are culturally learned, like minor mode, that is maybe not picked up on. So sometimes they, if you only rely on, on minor mode, then probably they won't won't recognize this right. as sad music. So, That's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, you've, you've spent a lot of your career investigating mechanisms behind how we process sound and more recently uh -huh. how we produce sound. What are some of the approaches you take sort of in the laboratory for understanding what mm. is going on in our brains when we're processing sound or even maybe nowadays producing yeah. sound? So, I mean, the first thing is, of course, to select the right type of music mm -hmm. or to manipulate the music in a way that it sounds sad or happy or pleasant and unpleasant. So you can play a lot with dissonance and, and consonance. So we ran a study uh, quite a while back where we played uh, one piece of music we transposed it a semitone up and a tritone was down and played all these three versions at the same time. It's really terrible. <laughs> it sounds super unpleasant, super dissonant. So you can you can play with the music. You can also analyze the music. So you can have uh, play the music and have people rate how sad it sounds and then look at what feature is it in the music that makes them sad. And then we look in the brain. I mean, we we can use electroencephalography. That's the the mechanism or the tool where you put the cap with with electrodes on on people's heads and you measure the the, the brain activity in real time and millisecond resolution, um, and you analyze different features of these of these brain signals. So you can analyze um, evoked responses. So when you have a loud note how spiky your, your ERP or ventilated potential gets. You can analyze uh, oscillations, so how your brain locks into the music. So if you like music, then your brain just tracks it. Um, so you can sort of strongly. see how the, the brain is following along with the music exactly, like in real time. Exactly, exactly. And it, by the way, just as a side note, it does the same with speech. So we also track the, the speech signal. Um, Apart from this electroencephalography, we can also use functional magnetic resonance imaging. That's uh, what people probably have, have seen and some of them also experience, where you 
are lying on that bed and are moved into the scanner tube. And then your brain is being scanned um, while you're doing a task. So people are in the scanner, they are listening to music um, that we've manipulated, and usually they have two buttons to say, yes, I like it, or I don't like it, mm -hmm. or this is sad, or this is, this is happy. And um, this method is a bit different from uh, EEG because it doesn't measure the brain activity directly. What it measures is the oxygenation of the blood. And the idea is that this brain area that need that is active needs a lot of oxygen. So the, the oxygenated blood is pumped into that area with a little delay though. So it's usually a six seconds delay. So we, we don't have a good spa uh, temporal resolution, but we know exactly where things are happening. So these two methods are complementary. We use both of them to see where things happen and when things happen in the brain. That's very cool. Mm. And so, I mean, you mentioned the sort of this following along in the EEG mm. of like music and how that is similar to how we process speech. Are there differences that you can observe when somebody's listening to say this podcast or when they're listening to uh, Radiohead in their car or something like that? Mm. Like, are there, are there distinct <laughs> like, you know, um, features that could tell you this brain is listening to music and this brain is listening to speech? Ha. Uh, we have to make one, one, um, one distinction mm -hmm. here. The brain tracks, in, in our view, the brain tracks music and speech in a very similar way, mm -hmm. but speech and music differ in their regularity. So music is, is typically much more regular. It follows some than, meter. Yeah, some it follows the meter, it follows the beat. And speech is, is also sort of regular, but not as regular as, as music. And also, um, people have found that the, the speed is a bit different. So in, in speech, uh, we have a, a specific syllable rate. So we produce um, um, a, a so-called five hertz rhythm. So every 200 milliseconds, we have a, a new syllable. That's also the, um, the frequency with which we open and close our jaws mm. while, while talking. And music is a bit slower, so you, you have notes, um, a very frequent tempo is 120 beats per minute, it's one note for 500, every 500 milliseconds, so it's a bit slower. Mm. So that makes a difference for the tracking, but now comes the interesting thing. In speech, you do have a speech rhythm as well, and you do not stress every syllable, but it's sometimes every second syllable, and there you have the same rhythm as hmm the music. So and that's where, um, for me, in my, in my research, things come together. You have the music on the one side and you have the speech melody, which we call the prosody, on the other side. And that's where things become, for my taste, comparable. So the speech melody, the pitch and the rhythm of the speech and the, and the music. So it sounds like then that speech and music, from a raw like sensory perspective, it would be kind of simple to say, okay, the activity of this brain is processing the song and this one's doing the speech because there's certain basic features in terms of like the rhythmicity and stuff that would help to distinguish them as sounds. But in terms of the overall way that the information is being delivered and some of the structural content of it, there's a lot of similarity there actually. Yes, it's, okay. it's, it's actually, it's both. I mean, um, they have, people have found that speech and music are processed in, in slightly different places in the brain. That, well, these were recent recent studies, but I still believe that the brain is just a lazy organ <laughs> and tries to apply similar mechanisms to different to different inputs just uh, to conserve energy. Yeah, yeah. interesting. One thing I found really interesting that you just mentioned is um, the idea how culture might affect some of these mm. processing, especially, you know, when you're talking about speech melody, I could imagine different cultural uh, languages have different speech melodies or mm -hmm. intonations, for mm -hmm. example. But even you know, in how we relate to music, I imagine that would be affected culturally as well. Um, do you see differences in, for example, how the brain processes work depending on the culture? We see it uh, a lot in in behavior. So you do have, for example, and there we also see links between speech and music. So you do have um, languages that are stress-timed languages, like English and and German. And you have uh, languages that are so-called syllable-timed, um, which is French and Italian. And there you, you, you see it's people use different tools to emphasize syllables. 
you know, they make it louder or they, they make syllables longer. And this apparently seems to have an effect on how um, these people also use and, and, and perceive music. There was the seminal study by Annie Patel back in 2003, but it's like still a very, it's a classic. Um, he tested, um, he analyzed uh, the rhythm of French and uh, German composers. So basically, not only French and German, but composers who spoke a stress-timed and a syllable-timed language. And he analyzed their compositions, and he found similar differences in stress patterns hmm. in their music as in their in their native language. So that is not an, 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 a neural study, but it, it shows somehow that, that music and language and, and prosody, rhythm is part of prosody, is, is somehow somehow linked in the way people produce speech and music. So I, mean, I guess one question about, you know, how you can perform some of these studies where you're recording from people and trying to understand how they, they process music. Like one very important caveat of that is a lot of your subjects have to be musicians. A lot of them have to have kind of like a lot of um, familiarity and music theory and like understanding of like the mm -hmm. rules of music. Mm -hmm. um, what is different about how a musician's brain processes music compared to like say a, a lay person's brain mm -hmm. i think I, I should say one thing everybody is musical okay <laughs> <laughs> even even people who have not uh, learned a musical instrument is musical so um if i play you a tune that you don't know but i insert a sour note mm -hmm. most people will hear it and why is that because we have so much exposure during our lifetime sure as babies we just pick up on on the rules of our music, everybody does. Mm -hmm. um, once you practice as a musician, once you train as a musician, you become much more aware of these rules. It's like when you learn a, a second language, you learn also the rules of the grammar. Mm. And once you are asked by a non-native speaker why you express this and that in that way in your native language, you just can't tell because you have, you have knowledge of the rules, but it's implicit. So we have implicit knowledge of the music and implicit knowledge of the language. But once you practice it as a musician, it becomes more explicit. Um, it also, um, playing a musical instrument challenges your brain. I mean, you have to listen very carefully. You have to be very skilled in your, in your movements. You have to be very coordinated in your, in your left and right hand. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, has effects on your brain. So it's, it's been known for quite a while that, for example, the auditory areas in musicians have a thicker gray matter. It's a, it's a plasticity effect. Or the connection between the, the brain and the hand via the corticospinal tract, it's a white matter fiber tract, is thicker in musicians than in non-musicians. It's because if you have a thicker tract, the transmission rate is faster. Mm -hmm. And I mean, guess how fast a pianist has to strike a key? They can do seven keystrokes in a second. Mm -hmm. I mean, tried it. Yeah. So that the transmission rate has to be fast. So that these are effects you see. Talking about some of the questions that you've you've been interested in, one of the things you talked about today were how when you use these types of sort of functional imaging types of experiments, mm -hmm. you can identify networks, discrete networks mm -hmm. that are involved in sort of a person's assessment of what they're listening to, and that might mean violations of expected chord progressions or even changes if you're watching somebody's you know gestures for mm -hmm. for keystrokes mm -hmm. they can actually say like well that's not the natural finger mm -hmm. pattern mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. i would use to make that that chord um those are probably people that have familiarity with what it would look like yes. to normally hit those chords how do you find your subjects? I mean, how do you, re it seems like a, <laughs> you know, a limited pool um, to find humans to do fMRI studies in general, but yours is, is very yeah. specific. Um, do you have like uh, agreements with like local symphonies and things like that? You know, so. you know, the trick is the, the cafe just around the, the corner, you know, that is uh, halfway between the Max Planck Institute and the Music Conservatory. Oh, nice. And when you go, <laughs> when you go there <laughs> at, five, at 5 p.m., all the pianists are there having That's their cool. coffee and you just go there and hey, we are running a new study. Or when we do our jazz experiments, I mean, we have a very good excuse to go to the jazz clubs in the, at night and just distribute our cards to the musicians. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, um, so it's very hand-picked people. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, so back to those types of studies that mm -hmm. you were working on, um, you know, when, when you're designing these, 
experiments mm -hmm. and you're sort of thinking about what are the questions that you're interested in as a, as a scientist. Um, how do you have to sort of reconcile like what music is, the structure of music, the rules that it follows, and then like how experimentally tractable it would be to manipulate those types of things in the oh, lab. Yeah. So mm -hmm. one of the things that you pointed out in your talk today that I thought was really interesting is that the rules of music sort of follow these hierarchical mm -hmm. patterns, the relationships between the different chords. Uh, you know, one chord here is referencing another chord here at a different point mm -hmm. in the song, but the motor output is sort of a linear sequence mm -hmm. of muscle activity. Yeah. So the brain must be doing kind of like a tracking of both sets of things simultaneously. Um, what are some of the things that you found in those studies? Like, are, are there distinct networks for, for governing a person's perception of the rules of the sound and others for motor activity or that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. What we find is two networks that process the serial movement of the fingers on the, on the keyboard and other networks that process the hierarchy of the, of the musical harmony. The interesting thing is that we use the same network that processes the hierarchy or plans the hierarchy in the movements. We also find this network during perception. Hmm. So we do see an overlap of perception and production, which is maybe not surprising because usually we, when we produce, we also perceive, right? So these two things are, are trained at the same time. It's a peculiarity of our experiments that we switch off the sound, you know, but we still find the same network as, as during perception. So I remember decades ago, there was all this um, talk in the neuroscience world of some very famous studies on mirror neurons and how mm. there's this link between somebody observing somebody doing an action and having patterns of activity mm -hmm. in their, their brain that would be similar to what would be happening if they were in fact engaging in it. Is there anything kind of similar in a musician's brain when they're listening to a sound? Do they sort of automatically kind of decode that into the muscle patterns that mm -hmm. would generate that, um, that a norm, like a, a lay person would not necessarily have the inclination to do? Yes, that's, that's indeed the case. We, we do not call it mirror neurons because in humans, I mean, these studies come from monkey research where they really mm -hmm. could study record neurons. Record a single neuron. Could yeah. record the neurons, but it's a mirror mechanism. Uh, we call it. And it, uh, a, a colleague of mine in, in Frankfurt actually did that study. He um, had uh, novices practice melodies on the, on the keyboard. And then he put them into the scanner and just played them the sound of the, of the melodies. And he could decode from their motor areas what melodies they heard. So it's uh, it's essentially um, this audio motor link that that musicians build up, um, that, and also non musicians do just for other things for speech, for example. We do have this mechanism as well. So so yes, you do see this this audio motor coupling, which you could call a, a mirror mechanism, a mirror system, yeah, or a something. mirror system. That's very cool. Yeah. yeah, and you saw something similar, I think, and and even um, went deeper to try to understand how this sort of mirroring effect would um, come into play in a more complex test when people have to actually play together and mm. interact, for example, when people are playing a duet. And um, before we get into the specifics of the study, I want to just highlight that you had to make a major technical um, <laughs> oh, sort of yes. jump in order to <laughs> even begin to start to that study um, mm -hmm. these questions. So you actually had to find a way to mm -hmm. enable a participant in the study to play a piano in an fMRI machine. And so maybe you could just describe to our listeners why that's a challenge, first of all, and um, you know how you came up with this idea and what sort of resources you had to overcome this mm -hmm. challenge. So everybody who knows the size of a piano <laughs> and who knows the, <laughs> the size of a, of, a, of a scanner tube knows that this is impossible to do, right? And there's a second thing. Uh, the scanner has a very strong magnetic field. Um, so everything that is ferromagnetic is really dangerous because things really start to fly in the scanner. And you could basically throw a piano across the room with the, <laughs> And the damage yeah. the scanner <laughs> forever. Yes. So you need uh, a piano that has no ferromagnetic uh, material in it. And you need to have a, a size that fits into the scanner. And I think our musicians always also want a piano that feels like a piano. Mm. Yeah. So musicians, professional musicians, they really need the haptics of a piano. So we had 
the chance to collaborate with a sound engineer from McGill and a piano manufacturer in Leipzig, Blüthner manufacturer. And uh, they constructed, I, I, th I hope they didn't, but they chopped 27 <laughs> keys out of a grand piano. So it still had all the hammers and uh, all the haptics of a grand piano, uh, but without any um, magnetic material, 27 keys that fit into the, the scanner bore. And uh, the trick is we, we don't have strings in that piano, but the trick is that we use light that uh, shines on the back of the keys and when you press the key then uh, yeah you you can you can measure how much light comes back that that goes to a computer the computer generates the sound that is fed back to the earphones of a pianist and there we there we go the pianist is then lying on the back in the scanner and plays like <laughs> plays the piano in a weird position but it's it's doable mm -hmm. they can do it yeah. with the right hand and they're able to learn it quickly yes yeah but it's it's not easy. I mean, whoever tried to type on a laptop in bed, <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. So okay. now that you have this, mm. you know, technical innovation, what sort of questions did you want to address? Um, mm -hmm. What sort of additional layers of complexity that you could study now? Someone performing in an fMRI machine and then adding in a duetting piano on the outside. What sort of things do they need to focus on um, differently than if they were doing a solo performance, for example? Playing a solo requires a coordination with the partner. So it's not only that you have to focus on your own part and, and do it properly, but you have to sort of anticipate when your partner is striking a key and you have to adapt to that tempo or these peculiarities of the partner to, to play in sync. I mean, especially in classical music, synchrony is the key. Mm. Yeah. And um, how people do that can only be studied in interaction. I mean, you can have a computer and have the pianist play with the computer, but the computer is just too regular. Mm -hmm. yeah? You have to have the, the natural interaction to, to study that. And that's what we did. I mean, we had one pianist in the scanner, the other one outside. They could hear each other, and they were playing duets. So our pianist in the scanner played the melody, and the person outside played the bass line, and they had to synchronize. Yeah. And then you're basically looking for m ways to manipulate that interaction. Are, are there ways mm -hmm. to sort of disrupt the feedback they're, they're getting of maybe themselves or the other person that are interesting, like in terms of motor planning? We we can we can do that. We can do we can mess with the with the with the auditory feedback. What we did in the first place here is we manipulated whether our pianist in the scanner had only practiced their own part, the melody, or had also practiced the left hand, the bass line. You know? The person inside did never play the bass line, never ever, but the pure knowledge of the bass line, we thought, would have an effect on the interaction. Because knowing the bass line, coming back to the mirror neurons, will allow you to motorically simulate what the other person is doing outside. And um, indeed, we found that uh, when we, kn when the pianist knew the part of the partner, the bass line, he or she showed higher motor activity than in the conditions where she only knew the the, the melody. Hmm. So we believe that this is a good first evidence that people may really simulate the, the partner outside to anticipate when when the key is pushed by the partner to end adapt to that performance. Interesting. Mm. So the idea is that they're actually making sort of a particip um, a prediction of what should be played by the duetting partner, correct? And then comparing that to what they actually hear. Exactly. And they do it in their own motor system. I see. Interesting. Yeah? By really interesting. kind of mirroring what the other would do. I got a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Mm -hmm. When people are... I imagine they're listening to each other. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Is from what I know with uh, recording, typically uh -huh. when playing with other people, there's there's a lot of uh, listening to each other in order to quote unquote get the feel right. Mm -hmm. Is there a 
Is there an additional external stimulus like a click track or a metronome in which they're both initially making sure that they're asynchronous with one another? Or or are they from the jump just completely listening to each other like you would in, say, a stage Mm. performance? We give them four metronome clicks Ah, at the beginning as a... As a start, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, if there is some sort of asynchronous activity, maybe that you know they're not perfectly on tune, then how does the brain actually adapt to that? Yes. So we, uh, when that happens, so they are a little bit asynchronous. Um, so basically, the prediction you make when the partner will strike a key is not just not ha- not correct. Then we see activity in the cerebellum, in an area that actually controls the left hand, that is never played by the by the pianist hmm. in the in the scanner, and an area that has been shown to be involved in action observation. So again, we we are getting back to the idea of action simulation, uh, observation. That's that's uh, pretty similar, and. Here we see higher activity when there are slight asynchronies, as if the system picks up on say, oh, shoot, there's something not, not quite right. Mm-hmm. Um, so the cerebellum plays a, a huge role here. It's a it's um, a part of the brain that we tended to ignore in, uh, in in music cognition research. We were very much focused on the on the cortex. But we are becoming more and more aware that the, the cerebellum, with its many, many neurons, it has almost as many neurons as the cortex, yeah, plays a, a major role, especially when it comes to subtle timing, timing issues. So it's like mm-hmm. it, internally there's this kind of constant evaluation of what the expectation is of the on, beha- on behalf of the musician in terms of both what it's hearing mm-hmm. back and what the motor output should be generating. And you, you know, experimentally can kind of manipulate those expectations, like create little violations here. And exactly. That seems maybe like a large part of what the brain's responding to is like when things deviate from the plan. So is a lot of the performance of music just sort of like executing a plan and hoping everything goes according to plan, but a lot of times there's little bits of chaos in there? Or? Yes, you have constant feedback loops constant feedback loops between your motor system, between the auditory system, between your timer in the, in the cerebellum. So playing music is a lot of feedback. And um, it's also interesting that this uh, feedback control is typically slightly ahead of time. Before you've actually pressed a key, you already have this, this prediction what mm. will happen next. And there's an interesting thing that colleagues of mine found out, that when you study pianists, who just play a melody and they are about to commit a mistake, you can see this already before they strike the key. So it's as if the brain already know, gosh, that's going to be wrong. But they cannot withhold the the key press. So you see it in a, a fraction of milliseconds before they press the key. Michael Jordan once said that like he could tell if he was going to hit a pass the second it left his fingers. He'd be just like, I, love, I know. It's yes. just like, you said, it's a movement that you've rehearsed a thousand times in every possible permutation, and you just your brain knows if it did it right, basically. I love that study. It's, I, I know that uh, it, it was Michael Jordan who said it, and it was studied uh, by an Italian team, uh, Ariotti and, and, and colleagues, and they, they showed videos of uh, basketball uh, shots to professional basketball players like um, Michael Jordan, to just uh, commentators mm-hmm. of basketball games and to novices and and really the basketball players they could tell from the little finger really? whether this goes in or not because they were motorically simulating what they saw. I mean it's a similar mechanism as the mechanism we were just talking about in musicians so that they simulate in their motor system what the partner is doing. Michael Jordan was simulating what the guy in the video was doing. So, so that raises a question for me, you know, in the sort of cognitive neuroscience of music, mm-hmm. of music in the brain, there's all these sort of theoretically established things like, you know, forward models for motor planning, all this stuff that mm-hmm. you can sp- experimentally test, mm-hmm. like you can actually use, you know, our 
natural affinity and sort of the intrinsic like importance of music as a method for communication in our brains mm -hmm. to study these very specific motor uh, phenomenon and like sort of relate back to the theoretical and maybe even circuit understanding of how these things work. Mm -hmm. What, you know, sort of is the future for this field? Like, what do you see as like some of the important questions that remain to be, um, you know, studied in the world of like motor performance or even in sort of perceptual, the relationship between perception and action that you think maybe music is sort of uniquely um, situated to help us answer? Oh, I think there are so many questions. I mean, the first question is, why do we have music at all? Right, yeah. <laughs> it's, so no other species does it, at least not in the way humans do it. And what does it earn us? I mean, yeah. nobody knows. Maybe it's the social interaction that we can have uh, via music. Maybe it's the pleasure. I mean, that's another big question. Why is music pleasurable? It has like hedonic us. value and it like has hedonic value. Mm -hmm. It it triggers the reward centers. I mean, as if we eat chocolate or or, or win in the lottery. I mean, mm -hmm. it's the same thing, and it's just sound waves. It's right. uh, how how. <laughs> and we hear sound waves all the time. Like music is like very special to us, but the sound of traffic outside is it just noise. It's just noise. So right. what is it in the music that uh, that gives us these goosebumps and these these emotions? And why do we seek it out all the time? Is it Maybe it's really something social. I think we also uh, should continue studying um, not only duets, but bigger groups of musicians, and we should include the audience into that. Hmm. So what is it that makes a good concert? I, I, I think everybody who has been to concert knows that there is this spark between the audience yeah. and, the, and the performers. And a lot of performers have complained during COVID. I mean, it's not the same to right. perform in front of no audience. So, so what is it about that interaction? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. fascinating. And, and of course we have to do much more cross-cultural work because we are studying a lot of Western music, probably because it's very hard to transport a scanner to the <laughs> Amazonian. Uh, right. Um, but I mean, we have to start somewhere um, and uh, cross-cultural work needs to be done in a different way, but it's super important to really understand what it is that makes humans musical and what 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 is music uh, more generally yeah i guess th what you're saying about the cross cultural thing is like when you were talking about earlier like there's certain learned components probably and certain components that sort of come naturally out of our you know um our development or our learning yes, or that yes, sort of yes. thing and then some aspects of it that are probably hardwired due to evolution <laughs> essentially yeah, at this to, point to the particular brain structure we are equipped with but yeah um, by the way, the same thing applies to language. We're always studying English, German, French, Dutch, a little bit of Hebrew. But we should study many more languages to also understand the individu individual difference, the cross-cultural differences. And we may find that the brains are wired differently in people who speak different languages, just like brains are wired differently in jazz and classical musicians. Right. Yeah. You know? Interesting. Well, Dr. Samler, I'm sorry to say that I think we're out of time for today, but this conversation has been great, and it sounds like there are a lot of really interesting questions ahead for you. Um, you are going to be speaking tomorrow night at our Science Meets Music, and I think you might be talking a little bit more about the difference between jazz and classical musicians. Absolutely. Yes. So we'll look forward to talking to you more then. Thanks for having me. Thank it you. It was a pleasure. It was great. Take care.